just really want you to uh, explain this non-physical cons- causation uh, business before we get past that, because that's a... And we, co- I mean, I was going to ask the exact same okay. thing. Like, we come from a particularly, ma- I don't want to say materialist, because then it bends you into the group of materialism, and I don't necessarily feel, uh, feel any kinship to the materialists as a movement. But when it comes to something like science... I think that the the way that we've jury-rigged this for ourselves is that physics is the study of of things interacting. It's a materialist discipline. And I'm then happy. and say one more time. I'm happy with that. Okay. And then there's biology which is very much not a materialist discipline. Disagree with that. Okay. All right. Yeah, I guess because we I, I guess we just have to understand what we mean by physical and non-physical causality, yeah. yeah. So, let, like, let's just unpack this stuff for a little bit because it's uh, it, there's a, there's a lot here. Happy to. Well, first of all, you know as well as I do that when we dig down into the the, the sort of tinier and tinier aspects of our of our universe, what we call physicality is actually much more ephemeral and much lighter in the sense that. You know, when we dig down to to atomic scales and smaller, we're realizing, and this is why quantum field theory, you know, uh, succeeded that earlier, more mechanistic perspective of atomic structure, is that what we find is that there's 99.129s after the decimal point percentage of no thingness. And what actually remains is more the sort of interrelationships of what we call fields but what are feels, because what we now have the evidence for is that the perception of energy matter is that energy matter is actually in formation, expressed as what we call energy matter. And it doesn't mean that it's not real. It just means that quantization and the harmonics and the resonances that are in, you know, imbued within energy matter are perfect ways of expressing consciousness. And I don't just mean human consciousness here. I'm talking about universality here. You know, James Sir James Jeans, the Edwardian scientist and philosopher, talked about our universe being more a great thought than a great thing. Max Planck had the same view of consciousness being primary, as did Einstein, as did many others. So what I'm talking about now is not that energy, matter, and space-time are not real. They are the appearance of our universe. I'm saying that when we go beneath that to understand the hows of that appearance, we need to go to non-physical realms, which is why, you know, if you look at the Schrodinger equation, and most, in fact, all of the quantum equations, mathematics, are complex Mathematics, in other words, they have what we call real numbers and they have what we call imaginary numbers. And the imaginary numbers come from this concept of phase space. But if you actually speak to most cosmologists or many cosmologists now, they're realizing that phase space is where the, the levels of causation that then arises the appearance of our universe actually happen. It's that phase space is the sort of the boundary, as it were, of cosmic mind and cosmic intelligence, you know, creating a universe or our universe. So that's what I mean. And when we ally that, which we can talk about, to the holographic principle, we can see more clearly how that happens. My first question is, what is con- what do you mean by consciousness? Mm. Is that self-awareness or is it something... A, a more elaborate concept than that? What What is your definition for consciousness? <laughs> there are three of us here. We could probably come up with at least six definitions of consciousness. Well, I, I just think it's important because I don't, I wouldn't, I don't understand how to understand how some, how there's thoughts without a thinker. And so I feel like if no, I understand, I, I, I'm being facetious. It's just that there's always this perspective mm. that if you get three people in a room, there'll be six definition of consciousness. Um, I am guided by my clarity on consciousness and mind by my dear friend, Professor Max Vellmans, who is a seminal writer 
And Max talks about um, reflexive monism. And he talks about mind as being the, you know, whether it's cosmic mind or mind per se as being the ground of being. And then, as you say, that consciousness is a self-awareness of mind. So I don't just use the word consciousness. I do say that mind and consciousness aren't what we have. They're literally what we in the whole world are. Because I don't want to get into the parsing of you know, consciousness, what levels of self-consciousness, what levels of subliminality, what did it do, what have, and, and the realization of, as Einstein would say, cosmic mind is all pervasive in the appearance of our universe. And as Max Planck would say, consciousness, in other words, there is a self-awareness for our whole universe to be able to exist and evolve as a non-locally unified entity. And that, I would suggest, is what this evidence at all scales and many fields of research are now showing. And the way they're showing us is it enables us to transcend what I was frustrated about 60 years ago to, to come with an integral model that can be absolutely founded on mind, cosmic mind and consciousness, and show a howness from that perspective into a universe. I mean, I think that this this makes sense because you often will run up against the criticism that look, you can't explain the universe with ju- you can't explain stuff with just stuff. Like yeah. you, you, you end up in a position where somebody has to ask, like, well, why does it organize into the most fundamental unit of the stuff? Exactly. And as soon as you start to ask that question, then you have to create another frame to put the stuff into. And it seems like this is what this like phase space relationship that lies outside of the, the real is. Absolutely. And face space is as real. We're just, and I think our languaging, it's really interesting to me as a linguist as well, how our languaging around this is in an emergent process. Because, you know, um, when I was growing up and I was fascinated by quantum physics and astronomy and all the rest of it when I was very young, as well as ancient wisdom, but I, I now see that, you know, quantum has become a brand, you mm. know. Quantum shampoo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, it literally is. And yet, I would say that quantum is so last century because all the work that's been done, really, for the last 20 odd years, has been moving on from consciousness, not to, uh, on from quantum physics, not to throw it out, but just as quantum physics and relativity physics emerged and included and transcended Newtonian physics, now in formational physics, and it has to be metaphysics because of this underlying causation into the physicality of what we call our universe. It's a sort of an informational metaphysics of mind and consciousness. So we are expressing itself in complementary ways as as quantized energy matter and as entropic space-time. So our languaging needs to be, or will naturally, continue to, I think, evolve and emerge as this this ever more compelling evidence is revealing a much grander sense of the nature of reality that is essentially multidimensional reality. 